Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church. We are so delighted to have everyone here today in this space and those of you attending online. It's good to be together, a community of youth, adults, and children sharing the values of courage, reverence, and compassion. My name is Claire Schleicher, she, her, and I am a member of our board of directors. If you're accompanied by children today, we warmly welcome your whole family. We invite you to explore our Soul Work Center right over here by the windows, where you can explore different activities designed to help all ages actively engage with today's worship service. And I just saw some fun new activities for the kids over there, so don't be afraid to check it out. If you have a joy or sorrow that you would like to share in the meditation, please add it to the meditation bowl, which is right next to our soul work. Or you can put it in the chat box before the opening hymn. Please make sure to gain consent before you put someone's full name in the bowl. In the building, our social hall is once again a hub of connection, informal conversation, and cookies. You can also find tables and information about upcoming events. We hope that you will check it out after the service. If you're looking for a short time of connection, our small group conversations are still happening, both on Zoom and in the Emerson Alcove. However, if you however you participate, these small groups are self-facilitated, and there are some facilitation guidelines that are provided. In the alcove, they're printed on the table, and on Zoom, we'll be putting them in the chat box for you at the end of the service. So grab whatever you need and find your way there after the postload. This coming week continues our 2022 holiday services, including a community meal and solstice service on Wednesday night, which starts at 5.30 p.m., as well as three services um, 4, 6, and 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve. For all the service details and Zoom links for attending virtually, please visit our website at wbuuc.org slash holiday services. Also, mark your calendars for Monday morning, January 16th. This church is co-hosting the annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Community Breakfast with Parkview United Church of Christ. This event will take place at the Parkview UCC in White Bear Lake, just three minutes from here. Music will be provided by the amazing vocal ensemble, Cantus, and we'll also watch a broadcast of the keynote address from the MLK Breakfast in downtown Minneapolis now in its 33rd year. The keynote speaker will be Dr. Hedy Lamar Wells, the Executive Vice President of Social Responsibility for the YMCA of the North. The doors will open bright and early at 6.30 a.m. and they'll be serving a light continental breakfast at 6.45 a.m. The program begins at 7.15 a.m. Breakfast and program are free, but reservations are required for both. Space for breakfast is somewhat limited, so reserve your spot soon if you want to eat breakfast. What makes this event a success every year are the volunteers. This year, Parkview has asked us to help recruit volunteers to help with ushering and with the parking. Please visit the table in the social hall to sign up to volunteer and to learn more. You can also find more information and a registration link under the Justice tab on the WBUUC website. Welcome to our church, everyone. Together, we grow our souls and serve the world in love. Come in, come into this place which we make holy by our presence. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths, 
fears and anxieties, loves and hopes, for here you need not hide, nor pretend, nor be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this place where the ordinary is sanctified, the human is celebrated, the compassionate is expected. Come into this place. Together, we make it a holy place and welcome. I'm Reverend Sarah and I use my the pronoun she, her. Good morning. I'm Lisa Sem and I use the pronouns she, her. Having a tree in my living room for the month of December is one of the most magical, joy-filled traditions I can think of. Since my son Julian was a tiny tot, he's now a towering 13-year-old, my family has been making an annual trek to the Krieger's Christmas tree farm in Lake Elmo. Side note, the Kriegers are responsible for this stunning cluster of evergreens on our altar. I savor every small moment of the experience of getting our tree. The turn off Lake Elmo Avenue, learning the name of our tree, which is printed neatly on the tree tag. We took home Marilyn Monroe one year. <laughs> this year it's Drazen Petrovic. He's a Croatian basketball player, if you're wondering. I, I had to Google it and watching our tree get bagged and tied to the top of our car after going through the shaker machine. I love our walk through the small unpaved lot, winding our way through the pre-cut trees and choosing the exact right cut your own tree supplies. My husband, Jason, is in charge of carrying the handsaw. Julian pulls the sled and I steer us toward the field of Fraser firs that are tagged for cutting. When we started this tradition, we'd pull Julian on the tree sled as we examined each tree we passed for height, fullness, and shape. Now, he and Jason take turns with a saw and pulling our cut tree back to the cider house. Once we have our tree settled in its new home, our living room, we fill it with strings of white lights, a growing collection of ornaments from our annual SEM family travels, and a humble assortment of ornaments from my childhood. We usually have a fire burning in the fireplace, and I usually get in a little bit of trouble for micromanaging the ornament placement. <laughs> I love sitting in the glow of the tree lights at night. I didn't always have a real evergreen at Christmas. When I was growing up, 334 days out of the, of the year, my family's Christmas tree lived not in a sunlit field, but in the attic in a cardboard box. The tree box usually emerged from the attic the weekend after Thanksgiving. Some years I was around to witness the behind the scenes tree reconstruction process. My dad would shove the giant tree box down through the barely wide enough attic access door onto the floor in the second floor hallway right in front of my bedroom. From there, he'd send the box sailing down the staircase into the living room like a kid on a sled on a hill. Then, once the box was wrangled into the middle of the living room, I'd settle on the staircase landing, often with my sisters, tensely watching dad sift through the bundles of metal pine boughs. Hyper aware of his growing irritation as he reacquainted himself with this treasured annual tradition, the great Christmas tree puzzle challenge. We would giggle quietly, my sisters and I, listening to his colorful self-talk while, we, while he tested a half dozen strings of tree lights and labored to identify the evil dead bulb. Another side note, growing up, I was part of the colored light family. Now I've switched sides. The tree of my childhood was six feet tall with densely flocked needles on pudgy sausage-like branches. It wasn't even pretending to be a real tree. The glow from the colorful light tripled in size against the white needles. We three girls 
taking turns, carefully placed our ornaments on the branches we could reach. Next to candy canes and a few precious vintage ornaments from my grandmother's collection, we'd hang dozens of ornaments that we'd made at school or with mom or the Girl Scouts. There were shrinky dink manger scenes, salto snowmen, popsicle stick photo frames, God's eyes made from sticks and yarn, and angels with pipe cleaners for wings, to name just a few. Even then, as a child, I remember sneaking downstairs after everyone was in bed, curling up on the couch with a afghan, and falling asleep in the light of the Christmas tree. When I was in my early 30s, I sang with an octet that performed pro a program of Victorian Christmas carols at the James J. Hill House in St. Paul. I learned a beautiful story from our narrator about the advent of the modern indoor Christmas tree. It said that Martin Luther, the 16th century Protestant reformer, was walking home on a clear skied winter evening when he was overcome by the beauty of the stars shining through the branches of the evergreens. He was so taken with the experience that he tried to recreate it for his family by bringing indoors an evergreen into their main room and fixing lit candles onto its branches. I'm not sure if the story is true, but I like to think it is. Today, I light the chalice for the joyful magic of evergreens, living or not, inside or out, lit by starlight, twinkle lights, or candles. I'm Reverend Jack, and my pronouns are he, him. Join me, please, in the opening words. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Our opening hymn is Deck the Halls. Please rise and body your spirit, and the lyrics are on your screen, and on your printed order of service as well. We are honored this morning to celebrate the dedication of children into the life of this community. This is a long tradition in Unitarian Universalist congregations echoing our Christian heritage of the tradition of baptism and embracing the future of each of these children by honoring their uniqueness and joy. We're gonna invite a lot of families up this morning, so let's make some room when you come great will the families of charlotte bradley and alexander 
Danny, Peter, and Millie, Eliana, Emerson, and Jackson, Gwen, and Inga, Savannah, and Rose, join me up front. So we're talking mostly parents. Come on up. This is kind of scary. <laughs> it is. It's scary to do this, right? And stand in front of all these people. Let's all take a big, deep breath, OK? Big, deep breath together. Great. Each family here has brought their beloved children to honor their beautiful selves and the relationship they're forming with our community and a shared hope for their future. This moment, this ceremony is when together we formally recognize the naming of these children, remembering that their name is their own. It is a gift that has been given to them to do with as they will. We hope that your name, all of you, will serve you well and if there comes a time in your life when it no longer serves you, we will celebrate you and your new name. Exactly. We will give each of these children a rose, different from every other rose in the world as a symbol of your uniqueness. We removed the thorns as a symbol of the protection that we give as you learn and grow. When you come of age, we'll give you a rose with the thorns still intact to symbolize the new faith we have in you to navigate the challenges of this world. And water, water is the stuff of life. Water connects us all to living things, to all of humanity. And we use this water, which is a symbol of the water we collected in our annual water communion, a service we do use now to dedicate each one of you. I will offer and ask for your consent before I touch you to bless your thoughts when I touch your head, your words when I touch your chin, and your actions when I touch your hands. And I'll come down and ask each parent what they name their child. And then when we come back together, we'll say some words together. What do you name this child? Bradley. Is it okay if I touch you, Bradley? Okay. I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and may I have your hand, and your actions for the betterment of the world. Thank you. What do you name this child? Alexander. May I touch you? He's only one. Do you think yes? Okay. I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. And may I touch you? No, okay. Oh, yes, I can? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're doing just fine. May I touch you? Yes. I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. You did so good. And here's your rose. Look, each of you get a rose. Everyone. <laughs> Thank you. What do you name this child? Hi, Peter. May I touch you? I dedicate you, your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, what do you name this child? Millie. 
Thank you. May I touch you, Millie? I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. And what do you name this child? I did, Jack. May I touch you? You can say no. Okay. I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. Thank you. Now you each get a rose. Next. Okay. <laughs> We're having fun here. Hi. What do you name this child? Gwen Freya. Can I touch you? No, okay. I will dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. Thank you. What do you name this child? Hi, Inga Burl. May I touch you? You think so? Okay, that's a sad face, so I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay, I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. All right, and now you all get roses. Yay. <laughs> Look, even teeny babies get roses. Hello, would you like to go first? Yes. What do you name this child? Jackson. May I touch you? Yes. I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. What do you name this child? Emerson. May I touch you? I dedicate your thoughts your words and your actions for the betterment of the world. And here are your roses. It's coming. Oh. Thank you. Hi. Hello. What do you name this child? Rose Hannah. May I touch you, Rose? No, okay. I dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. All right. And you get a rose too. Yeah. Just like your name. Hello. Oh. <laughs> what do you name this child? Aliana. Aliana Joyce. May I touch you? <gasps> That's a big smile. Okay. I dedicate your thoughts, your action, your words, and your actions for the betterment of the world. Thank you. And here's yours. We're almost there. We can make it through. So for this part, I invite different people to have different responses. We welcome these beloved children amongst us. We give thanks for your life and for the hope that you bring us. We will appreciate your uniqueness. We will teach you and learn from you, and we will love and respect you. Will all the children present answer this question for me, all of the children here? Will you make these other kids feel welcome in your classes and help them when they need assistance? Yes? yes. Say yes really loud. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Congregation, all of those here, will you delight in these children's accomplishments, share, share in their sorrows, and encourage them in every way as they grow into adulthood? If so, say yes. 
families of these children, those of you who are here, will you promise to always be available for them and their loving parents in the journeys and adventures ahead and promise them your loving presence in their lives? If so, say, we will. Now parents, do you promise to love these children with all of your hearts? and dedicate yourselves to all that you can to provide them with roots so that they feel safe and wings so that they can fly. Will you strive to share with them the beauty and goodness of life? If so, say, we will. Everyone present, will you support these children and their parents through all the experiences of life if so, please give a hearty and enthusiastic, we will. we will. These children are dedicated. <laughs> you may all be seated now. Today's special collection is going to the Guest at Your Table collection. And here to tell us more about that program is Dick Ottman. Good morning. My name is Dick Ottman. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee started over 80 years ago during World War II when a Unitarian minister and his wife went to Nazi-controlled Europe and literally smuggled people and children. Seeing these children here reminded me of that. A lot of children escaped to freedom thanks to that couple. Now, after the war was over, we had an organization and we realized human rights were being violated still after the war. And so that's what the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee took on. And it took on projects throughout the world where people's human rights were being threatened. One of the ways they do this is by training local leaders who are empowered to carry out the necessary actions to help people whose human rights are being violated. And during this time of year, we just as the way to help you explain and understand some of the things that the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee does, they have what's called guests at your table. And they've singled out four of the programs, four of the guests to talk about this year, but they have many more. And I'll be willing to talk to anybody after the service or at any time about any of the other programs. The first guest, the honor, uh, works globally on international climate justice. The second guest is in Hungary, providing legal assistance and resources for people fleeing Ukraine. The third guest is helping U.S. immigration detain people who are LGBTQIA. And the fourth guest works with ethnic minorities in Burma, targeted by the military junta. Now, in any charity, People frequently bring this up to me. They're always a little skeptical. Geez, is the money that I donate, is it being used effectively? Let me tell you about the UUSC. They have a group of people who give more than 5,000 or more a year to the UUSC. They're called stewardship people. And there are several hundred of them. They have full access to the staff and they can go in the field and talk to each of the people in the field who are carrying out these programs. They meet once a year, they have a, a meeting once a year and they review with the staff again and the board what's going on. So that's the first check of what's going on. The second thing is there's a Unitarian Foundation 
that gives money. Everybody who donates at this time of year, $150 or more to guests at your table, UUSC, what happens is they match it dollar for dollar. No limit. You can donate a million and they'll match it. So uh, needless to say, they review what the UUSC is doing to make sure that it follows the seven principles of the Unitarian Universalist faith. And then the third thing is the charity navigator. They look at all charities and they give up to four stars for organizations have a low administrative cost. And the UUSC gets four stars every time they look at it for low administrative costs. And finally, my wife Judy and I have been involved with this organization for over 40 years. We have been to stewardship meetings. We have talked at length with three of the presidents of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. We have talked to all kinds of people involved and we have found nothing, absolutely nothing, that violates any of the principles of the seven principles of our faith or any misspending of any kind of money whatsoever. We have been so pleased with the organization that we have already set aside assets when we die that will be given to the UUSC. Uh, this was, for those of you who don't know, my wife is in memory care. This was negotiated many, many years ago that we would do this. So in honor of what's going on today, um, I bake cookies and I put them in the social hall. And if those of you who like things in writing, I put the things in writing uh, so you can read up on this. And um, you can write your check uh, to the WBUUC with guests in the memo line. Uh, and if anybody ever has any need to discuss UUSC with me, I am open to that discussion at any time. And I think you're going to give further directions. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Dick. So we will pass around the donation plates now. You can also donate in three other ways. On the WBUUC website, send a check or you can leave a check in the locked box outside the front office or use the text to give option found in the order of service or in the chat box. Whichever way you give, please indicate the word guest. Thank you for your generosity and your faith in this life we live together.
My name is Kristen Mayer. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And the story for this morning is life itself. Long ago, the land of the north was filled with wise old trees. The trees stood mighty and tall, and their wide leaves stayed green all year long. Every morning, life itself, a fiery orb, would rise in the sky. Life itself smiled down upon the trees, giving them warmth and light. And the trees smiled down upon the humans that lived there, giving them wood and fruit. And the humans smiled upon each other, sharing what they had. But then one day, life itself was called to the lands of the South, for it was needed there. Before it left, it spoke. Do not fret, it said. My friend darkness will watch over you while I am gone. Remember, life itself returns. Life itself always returns. And with that, it turned and moved toward the south. Darkness moved in just as it had promised. And though the air got colder, the humans did not worry, at least not at first. One being that lived among humans was fear. Fear was always present, whispering, be careful of the fire, lest you get burned. Don't let your children stray too far. But now that life itself was farther away and darkness was watching over more often, fear began to speak more plainly. Beware your neighbor, watch out for the forest creatures. And the humans began to listen more and worry. Where is life itself, they cried. Why has it left us alone? The trees, seeing their worry, spoke. Life itself returns, the trees said. Life itself always returns. You must trust. But the humans were still afraid. And so the trees called out to darkness. And as darkness moved amongst their branches, their leaves of green turned to yellow, orange, and red. And the humans, surrounded by color, forgot their worries and their fears and smiled upon each other once again. Fear, however, continued to speak. The air is getting colder, fear said. Will there be enough firewood? Surely you will freeze while your neighbors stay toasty and warm. And the humans began to worry again. They started chopping down branches after branches, even whole trees. Wait, cried the trees. You need only ask, and we will cover you. And the trees called to darkness again. And as darkness swirled around their branches, their leaves began to fall. And soon a warm blanket of red and orange and yellow leaves covered the land as far as the eye could see. And the trees spoke again. Life itself returns, they said. Life itself returns. You must trust. And the humans, toasty and warm under their blanket of leaves, smiled upon each other again and forgot their worries. Fear, however, continued to speak louder and louder. There is not enough fruit for everyone, fear said. Take what your family needs before others will. And soon human began to fear human. They began to fight over the fruit, taking more than they needed, more than they even wanted, while others had none. And the trees looked down on the chaos and hatred, and they could not smile. They could only weep. Big, wet, tears rolled down their bare branches and in the cold of darkness they froze into tiny needles of ice thousands and thousands of icicles rang out in the wind of darkness and the cold air was filled with the sound far away life itself heard the tinkling of icicles and it knew the trees had been weeping. Life itself turned back towards the north and reached out. Warmth and love filled those trees, melting those icicles and leaving in their place lush 
green needles of life. And the humans reached out. And when they touched those green needles, they remembered life itself returns. Life itself always returns. Soon, once again, life itself smiled down upon the trees, giving them warmth and light. And the trees smiled down upon the humans, giving them wood and fruit. And the humans smiled upon each other, sharing what they had. And fear? Fear was kept to a whisper, as it should be. The end. Please rise in body or spirit and join me for the next hymn, Green by Peter Mayer. We're going to sing it to the tune of People Look East, which is number 226 in the gray hymnal. Follow along if you'd like. Our reading is Christmas Mail by Ted Kuzer. Cards in each mailbox, angel, manger, star, and lamb, as the rural carrier driving the snowy roads hears from her bundles the plaintive bleeding of sheep, the shuffle of sandals, the clopping of clamels. At stop after stop, she opens the little tin door and places deep in the shadows the shepherds and wise men, the donkeys lank and weary, the cow who chews and muses, and from her styrofoam cup, white as a star and perched on the dashboard, leading her ever into the distance, there is a hint of hazelnut and then a touch of myrrh.
Today is a celebration day. We are dressed festively in our holiday finest jammies, in our dress up clothes, and in our silly sweaters. I'm still wearing mine. It's under here, I promise. Do, do, do. Silly sweater. <laughs> It's also the fourth ad, uh, Sunday of Advent, the season of waiting for Christmas. It's just one week away now, guys. It's also National Cookie Baking Day, National Roast a Suckling Pig Day, and also Billie Eilish's birthday. Today is also International Migrants Day, honoring those who have shifted their lives from living in one country to another, often leaving a home well known to them to settle permanently in a new place, usually because they are looking for a better life. This holiday created by the United Nations celebrates the courageous expressions of humanity's will to overcome adversity and to live a better life. Another important thing to celebrate today is World Arabic Language Day. Arabic is one of the most widely spoken languages in the world, spoken by nearly 390 million people around the globe, and it is the official language of Islam and one of the only modern languages that is still written and read right to left. Did you know that we actually use Arabic every day? Hey kids, did you know we use Arabic every day? <gasps> Do you know how we use Arabic? Anyone, anyone? Oh, I see some hands. We use it with numbers. Numbers are actually Arabic. Tonight, as the sun sets, Jewish families around the world will light the first candle of Hanukkah, beginning eight nights of quiet thanks and celebration. Although this is a minor holiday in the Jewish calendar, it usually falls right in December when we have our winter holidays, and it's a celebration of light, reminding us that hope and persistence are what can keep us going through hard times. This Wednesday, we will be gathering here for a solstice celebration, honoring the dark that has been keeping us safe this winter. And we will be celebrating the eventual return of the light, just like in Kristen's story. Thank you, Kristen. This tradition that we're gonna do on Wednesday, y'all, it involves going to a campfire <gasps> right out in the back of the thing. So I hope y'all are ready to come enjoy and celebrate with us. Later in the month, folks of African heritage in the United States are going to celebrate Kwanzaa, sharing about and celebrating the seven principles of African heritage. Now, one thing that all of these winter traditions have in common is the sense of honoring the ways that love holds us. We are held in loving embrace by the earth by our community, by our families, chosen and given families. We are held in love with our joys and our sorrows. We are a community of people who pray for one another. We pray in many different ways. Sometimes praying is asking for help or offering help. Sometimes saying a prayer to a divine being or by imagining light wrapping around someone. Sometimes a prayer is holding a person in our thoughts as we go about our day. And sometimes it's making cards, making cookies, making shawls, sending cards, bringing meals. There are so many ways to pray and show that we love one another. Today, in particular, let us hold Ginny Johansson and Ingrid Borsma, as they offer the gratitude of the prayers of the congregation in all their forms um, for Ginny's surgery, which was recently. Let us also hold Emily, who uh, this week miscarried her twins, which was devastating and especially devastating because it was her pregnancy loss number two of this year. 
So let's send lots of healing love to Emily and that family. We hold also the people who are struggling with addiction. We hold love and healing for surgery from Laverne. Let's send healing love for Carla recovering from a major surgery and hold also the Heathcote family as they honor the memory of Adam's father this weekend. Now that's a lot to hold, but as we know, we can hold a lot together when we share the burden. So I invite you now to speak into this silence, the joys, the sorrows, the names of the people that you want us to hold all together. many voices sharing many names and we can hold them all now as we move to close our service we're going to sing our traditional 12 days of christmas let us then remember also those who are here who love this tradition but can't be with us those who have moved or are ill or who have died in the last year we hold particularly Jeff Janicek and his family who are with us, who loved this tradition and brought many of us joy with the singing. To honor Jeff, when we get to five golden rings, you have to sing as loudly and apparatically as you can, okay? All right. So here we go. We're gonna bring all, anyone who wants to hold a placard, kids, families, individuals, to come forward and, and get a placard so you can see which numbers we're using here. And come on forward, but before we get into the actual singing, I wanna say that the last couple of words are different than the traditional 12 days of christmas so if you look at the placards it's not like lords of leaping um so we have instead the nine ladies dancing the ten lords what are the ten lords doing i lost that paper you gave me jack are they leaping but what are they doing on our pictures yeah let's look can we find a ten what are they doing? Piping, okay. And 11, what are we doing on 11? Anyone see the 11? Dancing, ladies dancing. What about 12? What do we have for 12? All right. You're great job, everybody. Yeah, you can get an order. <laughs> oh, love that. All right, great job, everybody. Okay. All right, let's see if we can be really quiet for a moment so we know when it's time to start, okay? <gasps> Take a deep breath and hold it. <gasps> okay, we're ready to start.
as we gather back our placards. <laughs> as I gather us back together and gather these beautiful placards, I want to let you know that it's a around very close to the 50th anniversary that this congregation has been using these placards and singing the 12 days of Christmas. Very exciting. So thank you, Elsa, for letting us still use them after all these years. All right, a blessing on you, a blessing on this congregation, especially a blessing on our dedicated children today. Go and be a blessing in the world and eat cookies. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.